When you're engaging in a behavior over and over and over again, and you're thinking to yourself, this isn't even that interesting. You're officially addicted. There's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that, remember, what is pornography doing to the brain? First of all, it's triggering the release of dopamine and in the short term, testosterone by the observation of sex, not actually engaging in human contact. Well, we'll just be, we're adults here. I mean, there's this idea that- Speak for yourself. <laughs> you look in the journals of sexual health. Yeah. And I'm really interested in, in sexual health and urological health. There's a ton of interesting stuff on pelvic floor. This stuff just isn't often discussed. Yeah. What you find is that a masturbation for women turns out to their self-reported notions of well-being, of mood, of immune system function, of quote unquote, knowing their bodies and what gives them pleasure, et cetera, mm -hmm. all increase. If you look at the data in men in terms of masturbation, and here we're talking about masturbation to the point of ejaculation in men, they report lower mood, less willingness to pursue relationships. Shocker. You know, they're, they're home watching <laughs> porn, right? So we, we have to be very careful with statements like <laughs> masturbation is bad or, or, or something yeah, like that, because yeah. that's not your, it's going to be gender. Well, we should say, stay out of that discussion. Biological sex dependent, because yeah, that's yeah. a clearer ground. We'll just leave it at that. And then there is this whole notion that a, lo a whole generation of young males are, are becoming porn addicted and masturbation addicted, but oh, can't yeah. look someone in the eye, ask them out on a date or learn how to navigate healthy consensual sex, yeah. right? And they're not doing neck work so they can't look anyone in the eye. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> uh, They've got flaccid feet and they don't do neck work. Uh. Yeah, I mean, and here I'm not trying to create notions of like hyper males. We're really just talking about a radical shift in the way that sexual health has evolved over the last 10 years mm -hmm. because of the accessibility of hardcore pornography, its relation to the dopamine system. Yeah, You know, so here I'm, I'm not trying to be evangelical or anything like that. I'm just saying these are, serious neurotransmitter slash hormone systems mm -hmm. and a whole generation of males is making themselves sated enough to not actually pursue a number of what used to be considered milestones toward the transition between young adulthood and true adulthood. Yeah. And, you know, his birth rates are low. Dating is low. Oh yeah. Sex, you know, a few people are having a lot more sex. So this is great for the people out there who are comfortable in social interactions. Right. <laughs> anyway, we, we don't want to go down that path too far, but these are deeply wired systems. Yeah. yeah. To they who have much, much yeah. will be given. Yeah. So for those of you willing to date and find relationship, Fedoja. Fedoja. <laughs> Thank you, Fedoja. Dopamine is what's called a neuromodulator. And I mentioned that only because neuromodulators modulate the brain. They make it more likely that certain things are gonna happen and less likely that others are gonna happen. So think of them kind of like a playlist. And I like to think about the kind of four playlists as neuromodulators, just to really simplify things, but make them clear. Serotonin does a lot of things, but in general, serotonin makes us feel pretty relaxed, blissful, and good with what we have, what we all, the relationships we already have, the food, our state of mind and body that we're already in, okay? If you ramp up serotonin really high, people tend to lose their appetite, lose their libido, and feel really blissed out, but kind of flat. It's, it kind of kills desire because why would you go after everything, anything, if you already have everything you need? Satiation. It's satiation, exactly. Certainly many people out there would like to break habits that they feel don't serve them well. One of the challenges in breaking habits is that many habits occur very, very quickly. And so there isn't an opportunity to intervene until the habit has already been initiated and in some cases completed. Well, there are a couple of tools that neuroscience and psychology tell us can be very beneficial. Some of those things are somewhat intuitive and relate to what I call foundational practices, meaning things that set the overall tone in your body and brain such that you would be less likely to engage in a particular habit or that would raise your level of awareness, both of your situation and to how you feel inside. So things like stress reduction, things like getting good sleep, things like quality nutrition, things like having positive routines arranged throughout your day, all of those, of course, will support you in trying to break particular habits. And while that can be very useful, it's admittedly very generic advice. It doesn't point to any one specific protocol. In order to identify a specific protocol that one could apply in order to break habits, we have to look at the mirror image of the sort of neuroplasticity that we talked about at the beginning of the episode. 
At the beginning of the episode, we talked about a form of neuroplasticity called long-term potentiation involving the NMDA receptor. Just to refresh your memory a little bit, it basically says that if a set of neurons is very electrically active, it's likely that over time, those neurons will communicate with themselves more easily because of changes in things like NMDA receptor activity, the recruitment of additional receptors, et cetera. It's essentially a cellular and molecular explanation for how something goes from unlearned to learned to reflexive. Now, in order to break synapses or to break apart neural connections that are serving a habit that you don't want to engage in, we need to engage the process called long-term depression. And long-term depression has nothing to do with a state of mental depression or a reduction in mood. So I really want to be clear that when I say depression in this context, it has nothing to do with psychological depression. It has nothing to do with mood. It's simply called long-term depression because just as long-term potentiation says if neuron A triggers the firing of neuron B and it does so very robustly over and over and over again, then neuron A will not have to fire as intensely or as frequently in order to activate neuron B in the future because they become potentiated, right? The threshold for co-activation has been reduced. There's a much higher probability that they will be activated together at low levels of intensity. That's essentially what long-term potentiation is. Long-term depression says that if neuron A is active and neuron B is not active within a particular time window, then the connection between neuron A and B will weaken over time, even if they started off very strongly connected. Okay, so I'm gonna repeat that because this is a pretty uh, detailed neurobiological mechanism, whereby if neuron A is active and neuron B is active, but at a different time or outside a particular, what we call temporal window, meaning outside a particular time window, then through long-term depression, the connection between neuron A and neuron B will weaken. And just as a point of interest, the NMDA receptor is also involved in long-term depression, although there are other molecular components involved as well. So how do you take two neurons that underlie a habit out of synchrony? How do you get them to fire asynchronously? This is pretty interesting with respect to the cellular molecular biology, but at the behavioral level, it's especially interesting. The way that one would do this is, let's say, for instance, you have a habit of picking up your phone mid-work session, okay? That's a reflexive habit I think that most people have experienced. And we often hear the idea that, oh, you know, the phone is so filled with access to dopamine and incredible things that we're just drawn to it. But if you notice what's happened with phone use over time, most people, including myself sometimes, I admit, find ourselves just looking at our phone or find ourselves in a particular app without actually having engaged in the conscious set of steps of, oh, I'm really curious what's going on in this particular app. I'm really curious what's going on in this particular website. And you just kind of find yourself in air quotes. uh, For those of you listening, I'm making air quotes. You just sort of find yourself doing it because the behavior of picking up your phone is sort of reflexive or has become fully reflexive. You see this a lot at meals where multiple people are there and no one's looking at their phone and then all of a sudden someone takes out their phone and you'll notice that other people just naturally take out their phone. It's this kind of um, observed, uh, observation-induced reflex. And I would wager that most people aren't consciously aware of the immediate steps involved. So the literature says there are a number of ways to break these sorts of habitual behaviors or reflexive behaviors. Most of those approaches involve establishing some sort of reward for not performing the activity or some sort of punishment for forming the activity. I've heard of um, some basic things that people will do, like they'll even put like a rubber band on their wrist and every time they complain or um, every time they do some behavior like pick up their phone, they'll give themselves a snap on the wrist. The uh, the rationale there is that you're trying to create a a somatic, a, a very physical representation of something that makes it very real and harder to overlook. Other people will just do a tick mark on a piece of paper, the sort of um, what gets measured is what gets managed kind of mindset, where if every time you do something, you take away the judgment, this is very new agey, I realize, but this is what you find out there if you uh, search the literature, and even on PubMed, uh, peer reviewed articles, that every time you engage in a behavior, you just measure the fact that you, that you uh, did that behavior. You just mark it down at the end of the day. People are supposed to look at that and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I spent uh, you know, 
three hours doing something or I did it 46 times. And in fact, a lot of apps, social media apps will start to give you warnings now if you opt in that you've been on the app for an hour. Would you like to leave? Most people just click right past it and go back in. I think very few people uh, say, oh my goodness, it's been an hour and therefore you're right. I absolutely shouldn't engage in this anymore. It's just far too easy to just blow past those reminders. Ready to conquer NoFap? Grab our digital NoFap guide now. End your porn addiction. Skyrocket your self-esteem and achieve your goals. Packed with proven techniques, expert advice, and relapse prevention tricks. Click the link below and break free today. It should become obvious why things like pornography, not just the accessibility of pornography, but the intensity of pornography can negatively shape real world romantic and sexual interactions. This is a serious concern. The discussion is happening now. The underlying neurobiological mechanisms you now understand. This isn't to pass judgment on whether or not people like or don't like pornography. That's an ethical discussion. It's a moral discussion that has to be decided for each individual. But again, any activity that evokes a lot of dopamine release will make it harder to achieve the same level and certainly the greater level of dopamine through a subsequent interaction. Yes, indeed, many people are addicted to pornography. And yes, indeed, many people who regularly indulge in pornography experience challenges in real world romantic interactions. You now understand the mechanisms behind what I'm telling you. Now I'd like to talk about the positive aspects of rewards for our behavior and the negative aspects of rewards for our behavior. And from that, I will suggest a protocol by which you can achieve a better relationship to your activities and to your dopamine system. In fact, it will help tune up your dopamine system for discipline, hard work, and motivation. Hard work is hard. Generally, most people don't like working hard. Some people do, but most people work hard in order to achieve some end goal. End goals are terrific and rewards are terrific, whether or not they are monetary, social, or any kind. Because of the way that dopamine relates to our perception of time, working hard at something for sake of a reward that comes afterward can make the hard work much more challenging and make us much less likely to lean into hard work in the future. Let me give you a couple examples by way of data and experiments. There's a classic experiment done actually at Stanford many years ago in which children in nursery school and kindergarten drew pictures. And they drew pictures because they liked to draw. The researchers took kids that liked to draw and they started giving them a reward for drawing. The reward generally was a gold star or something that a young child would find rewarding. Then they stopped giving them the gold star. And what they found is the children had a much lower tendency to draw on their own. No reward. Now, remember, this was an activity that prior to receiving a reward, the children intrinsically enjoyed and selected to do. No one was telling them to draw. What this relates to is so-called intrinsic versus extrinsic reinforcement. When we receive rewards, even if we give ourselves rewards for something, we tend to associate less pleasure with the actual activity itself that evoked the reward. Now that might seem counterintuitive, but that's just way that, the way that these dopaminergic circuits work. And now understanding these peaks and baselines in dopamine, which I won't review again, this should make sense. If you get a peak in dopamine from a reward, it's going to lower your baseline and the cognitive interpretation is that you didn't really do the activity because you enjoyed the activity, you did it for the reward. Now this doesn't mean all rewards of all kinds are bad, but it's also important to understand that dopamine controls our perception of time. When and how much dopamine we experience is the way that we carve up what we call our experience of time. When we engage in an activity, let's say school or hard work of any kind or exercise, because of the reward we are going to give ourselves or receive at the end, the trophy, the Sunday, the meal, whatever it happens to be, we actually are extending the time bin over which we are analyzing or perceiving that experience. And because the reward comes at the end, we start to dissociate the neural circuits for dopamine and reward that would have normally been active during the activity. And because it all arrives at the end, over time, 
we have the experience of less and less pleasure from that particular activity while we're doing it. Now, this is the antithesis of growth mindset. My colleague at Stanford, Carol Dweck, as many of you know, has come up with this incredible theory and principle, and it actually goes beyond theory and principle, called growth mindset, which is this striving to be better, to be in this mindset of I'm not there yet, but striving itself is the end goal. And that, of course, delivers you to tremendous performance. It's been observed over and over and over again that people that have growth mindset, kids that have growth mindset, end up performing very well because they're focused on the effort itself. And all of us can cultivate growth mindset. The neural mechanism of cultivating growth mindset involves learning to access the rewards from effort and doing. And that's hard to do because you have to engage this prefrontal component of the mesolimbic circuit. You have to tell yourself, okay, this effort is great. This effort is pleasurable, even though you might actually be in a state of physical pain from the exercise, or I can recall this from college, just feeling like I wanted to get up from my desk, but forcing myself to study, forcing myself and forcing myself. What you find over time is that you can start to associate a dopamine release. You can evoke dopamine release from the friction and the challenge that you happen to be in. You completely eliminate the ability to generate those circuits and the rewarding process of being able to reward friction while in effort if you are focused only on the goal that comes at the end because of the way that dopamine marks time. So if you say, oh, I'm going to do this very hard thing and I'm going to push and push and push and push for that end goal that comes later, not only do you enjoy the process of what you're doing less, you actually make it more painful while you're engaging in it. You make yourself less efficient at it because if you were able to access dopamine while in effort, dopamine has all these incredible properties of increasing the amount of energy in our body and in our mind, our ability to focus by way of dopamine's conversion into epinephrine. But also you are undermining your ability to lean back into that activity the next time. The next time you need twice as much coffee and three times as much loud music and four times as much energy drink and the social connection just to get out the door in order to do the run or to study. So what's more beneficial, in fact, can serve as a tremendous amplifier on all endeavors that you engage in, especially hard endeavors, is to A, not start layering in other sources of dopamine in order to get to the starting line, not layering in other sources of dopamine in order to be able to continue, but rather to subjectively start to attach the feeling of friction and effort to an internally generated reward system. And this is not meant to be vague. This is a system that exists in your mind that exists in the minds of humans for hundreds of thousands of years by which you're not just pursuing the things that are innately pleasurable, food, sex, warmth, water when you're thirsty. But the beauty of this mesolimbic reward pathway that I talked about earlier is that it includes the forebrain. So you can tell yourself the effort part is the good part. I know it's painful. I know this doesn't feel good, but I'm focused on this. I'm going to start to access the reward. You will find the rewards meaning the dopamine release inside of effort if you repeat this over and over again. And what's beautiful about it is that it starts to become reflexive for all types of effort. When we focus only on the trophy, only on the grade, only on the win as the reward, you undermine that entire process. So how do you do this? You do this in those moments of the most intense friction, you tell yourself, this is very painful. And because it's painful, it will evoke an increase in dopamine release later, meaning it will increase my baseline in dopamine. But you also have to tell yourself that in that moment, you are doing it by choice and you're doing it because you love it. And I know that sounds like lying to yourself. And in some ways it is lying to yourself, but it's lying to yourself in the context of a truth, which is that you want it to feel better you want it to feel even pleasurable. Now this is very far and away different from thinking about the reward that comes at the end, the hot fudge sundae for after you cross the finish line and you can replace hot fudge sundae with whatever reward happens to, to be appealing to you. We revere people who are capable of doing what I'm describing. David Goggins comes to mind as a really good example. Many of you are probably familiar with David Goggins, former Navy SEAL who 
essentially has made a post-military career career out of explaining and sharing his process of turning the effort into the reward. There are many other examples of this too, of course. Throughout evolutionary history, there's no question that we revered people who were willing to go out and forage and hunt and gather and caretake in ways that other members of our species probably found exhausting and probably would have preferred to just put their feet up or soak them in a cool stream rather than continue to forage. The ability to access this pleasure from effort aspect of our dopaminergic circuitry is without question the most powerful aspect of dopamine and our biology of dopamine. And the beautiful thing is it's accessible to all of us. But just to highlight the things that can interfere with and prevent you from getting dopamine release from effort itself. Don't spike dopamine prior to engaging in effort. And don't spike dopamine after engaging in effort. Learn to spike your dopamine from effort itself. Ready to conquer NoFap? Grab our digital NoFap guide now. End your porn addiction. Skyrocket your self-esteem and achieve your goals. Packed with proven techniques, expert advice, and relapse prevention tricks. Click the link below and break free today. I personally think that porn and the availability of porn is, is, a, real, is a real detriment to the developing brain. Along those lines, I've heard you say that in order to reset the dopamine system, essentially in order to break an addictive pattern, to become unaddicted, 30 days of zero interaction with that substance, that person, et cetera. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. And and 30 days is, in my clinical experience, the average amount of, t- of time it takes for the brain to reset reward pathways for dopamine transmission to regenerate itself. There's also a little bit of science that suggests that that's true. Some imaging studies showing that um, our brains are still in a dopamine deficit state two weeks um, after we've been using our drug. And then a, a study by Shuckett and Brown, which took a group of um, depressed men who also were addicted to alcohol, put them in a hospital where the, they had received no treatment for depression, but they had no, no access to alcohol in that time. And after four weeks, 80% of them no longer met criteria for major depression. So again, this idea that by depriving ourselves of this high dopamine, high reward, substance or behavior, we allow our brains to regenerate its own dopamine to, for the balance to really equilibrate. And then we're in a, a place where we can sort of enjoy other things. So that progressive narrowing of what right. brings one pleasure eventually yeah. expands. So I'd like to um, dissect out that 30 days a little more mm-hmm. finely. Um, and I also want to address how does one stop doing something for 30 days if the thing is a thought? So mm. we'll kind of I'll put that on the shelf for yeah. the moment. So days one through 10, I would imagine will be very uncomfortable. Yes. They're going to suck, right. basically, <laughs> to be quite honest. Because what if, the way you describe this pleasure pain balance, yeah. to my mind, says that if you remove what little pleasure one is getting or a lot of pleasure from engaging in some behavior, that's gone. The pain system is really ramped up and nothing is making me feel good. I'll just use myself as an example. I'm not in recovery, but you know, that 10 days is going to be miserable. Right. Anxiety, Mm -hmm. trouble sleeping, um, physical agitation into the point where, Mm -hmm. you know, um, maybe impulsive, angry. Should, should one expect all of that? Should the family members of people expect all of that? Yeah. So what I say to patients, and it's a really important piece of this intervention, is that you will feel worse before you feel better. Um, For how long? Yeah. This is probably the first question they ask, right? And, And I say, usually in my clinical experience, you'll feel worse for two weeks. But if you can make it through those first two weeks, the sun will start to come out in week three. And by week four, most people are feeling a whole lot better than they were before they stopped using their substance. So um, yeah, you have to, it's, it's a hard thing. Like you have to sign up for it. And I will say, obviously there are people with addictions that are so severe that 
as long as they have access to their drug or behavior, they're not able to stop themselves. And that's why we have you know higher levels of care sure. or residential treatment. So this is not going to be for everybody, this intervention, but it's amazing how many people with really severe addictions to things like heroin, cocaine, you know, very severe pornography addictions. I posit this, and I do it as an experiment. I said, you know what, let's try this experiment. I'm always amazed, number one, how many of them are willing, and number two, how many of them are actually able to do it. They are able to do it. And, and so that little nudge is sort of just what they need. And the carrot is, you know, there's a better life out there for you. And you'll be able to taste it in a month. You really will be able to begin to see that you can feel better and that there's another way. So the way you describe it um, seems like it's hard. Mm -hmm. but it's doable for yes. most people, not yeah. everybody. Right. And we'll return to the that category of people who can't do that on their own. Um, well, then days 21 through 30, uh, people are feeling better. The sun is starting to come out, as you mentioned, They, it, which translates in the narrative we've created here and supported by biology that dopamine is starting to be released in response to the taste of a really good cup of coffee. For yes, instance. exactly. That, whereas before it was only to insert, you know, addictive behavior. Right. That's right. <laughs> what, whichever. Of course, coffee to can be addictive too, but but we'll leave sure. that aside. <laughs> yeah, I feel like coffee has a kind of um, consumption limiting mechanism built in, where at some point you just can't ingest anymore. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's wrong. Sorry to give lift to the <laughs> caffeine addicts out there <laughs> as I, cl as I clutch my, my, my mug. Um, so days 21 through 30, um, I've seen a lot of people go through addiction and addiction treatment. I've spent a lot of time in those places, actually, um, looking at it, researching, I've got friends in that community. I, I'm close with that community. And so what I'd like to talk about in this context is what sorts of things help other people that we know that are addicted what really helps right not uh not what could help but what really helps and are there certain people for whom it's hopeless i mean i don't like to hold the conversation that way but i wouldn't be close to the real life data if if i didn't ask is it is it hopeless are there people who just will not be able to quit their substance use or their addictive behavior despite I have to assume really wanting to. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there are people who will die of their disease of addiction, you know, and I think conceptualizing it as a disease is a helpful frame. There are other frames that we could use, but I do think given the brain physiologic changes that occur with sustained heavy drug use and what we know happens to the brain, it, it is really reasonable to think of it as a brain disease. And, and for me, the real window of, let's say, being able to access my compassion around people who are repeat relapsers, even when their life is so much better when right. they're in oh, recovery. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, it's like a no brainer, right? Um, is, is to conceptualize this balance and the dopamine deficit state and a balance tilt, tilted to the side of pain. And to imagine that for some people after a month or six months, or maybe even six years, their balance is still tipped to the side of pain that on some level that balance has lost its resilience and its ability to restore homeostasis. It's almost like the hinge on that balance yes, is messed up. Exactly. And so, I mean, for, for someone who's never experienced addiction like yourself, maybe one one way to conceptualize it is. Well, I didn't say that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I, 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 I was not. I, to be clear, I, I was not referring to myself. But I, I, I in this example I was given, I, if I were, I, I would I would um, come clean. I I would reveal that. Um, but I I think that especially after hearing some of your lectures and descriptions of the range of things that are addic addictive, yeah. I think. Um, I've been fortunate. I don't have a propensity for drugs or alcohol. Right. Okay. I'm, lu I'm lucky in that right, way right. that I, frankly, if they remove all the alcohol from the planet, I'll just be relieved because no one will offer it to me. anymore. Right. Right. So don't send me any alcohol. <laughs> uh, it won't go to me. Right. Um, Imagine that you had an itch somewhere on your body. Okay. And it was, in, I mean, we've all had that, like, you know, whatever the source, it was super, super itchy. You can go for uh, you know, if you really focus, you could go for a pretty good amount of time not scratching it. 
But the moment you stopped focusing on not scratching it, you would scratch it. And maybe you would do it while you were asleep, right? That, so, and that is what happens to people with severe addiction. That balance is essentially broken. Homeostasis does not get restored despite sustained abstinence. They're living with that constant specter of that pull, it never goes away. So let me say there are lots of people with addiction for whom that does go away. And it goes away at four weeks for many of them. But in severe cases, that's always there and it's lingering. And it's the moment when they're not focusing on not using, it's like a reflex, they fall back into it. It's not purposeful. It's not because they wanna get high. It's not because they value using drugs more than they do their family. None of that, it's that, Really, they 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 cannot not do it when given the opportunity and that moment when they're not thinking about it. Does that make sense? That's a great description. And actually, in that description, I can feel a bit of empathy because the way you describe scratching an itch in your sleep. Yeah. You know, I've I've done that with mosquito bites in right. summer. You're scratching, you're like, oh, you right. wake up scratching that, right. that, that mosquito bite. And I also have to admit that I've experienced not feeling like I want to pick up my phone because it's so rewarding, but just finding myself doing it. Yes, of course. Like I'm not yes. going to use this thing. I'm not going to use this thing. Right. And, then, and then just finding myself. Yes. Doing it. Like, what am I right. doing here? Right. Sort of the, how did I get back yes. here again? Right. And I, I know enough about brain function to understand that we have circuits that generate deliberate behavior and we have circuits that generate reflexive behavior. And one of the goals of the nervous system is to make the deliberate stuff reflexive so you don't have to make the decision because decision making is a very costly thing to do. Exactly. Decision making of any kind. Right, right. So that does really help. Um, the uh, I, I wanna just try and weave together this um, this dopamine puzzle, however, because if by week, so first, phase of this uh, 30 or 40 day um, detox. It's like a dopamine fast, right? Right. Okay. First 10 days are miserable. Middle 10 days, the clouds are out. There may be some shards of sunlight coming through and then all of a sudden sun starts to come out, it gets brighter and brighter. Why is it then that people will relapse, not just after getting fired from a job or their spouse leaving them, but when things are going really well? Yes. Is it this unconscious mechanism because i've seen this before is uh they have a great win i have a friend who's a really impressive creative um i don't want to reveal any more than that but uh and relapsed upon getting another really terrific opportunity to create for the entire world and i was like how can that happen mm. but now i'm beginning to wonder was it the dopamine associated with that win mm. that mm -hmm. opened the spigot mm -hmm. on this dopamine system mm -hmm. because yeah. um it happened in a phase of, of a really great stretch of life. Yeah, right. Yeah, so you, you raised that great point about triggers, right? And triggers are things that make us want to go back to using our drug. And the key thing about triggers, whatever they are, is they also release a little bit of dopamine, right? So just thinking about um, whatever the trigger is that we associate with drug use or just thinking about drug use can already release this anticipatory dopamine, this little mini spike. But here's the part that I think is really fascinating. That mini spike is followed by a mini deficit state. So it goes up and then it doesn't go back down to baseline. It goes below baseline tonic levels and that's craving right? So that anticipation is immediately followed by wanting the drug. And it's that dopamine deficit state that drives the motivation to go and get the drug. So many people talk about dopamine is not really about pleasure, but about wanting and about motivation. And so it is that deficit state that then drives the locomotion to get it. And earlier, your description of dopamine being involved in the desire for more giving the sense of reward, but also movement. Right. I have to assume that those things are braided together yes. in our nervous system yes. for the specific intention of when you feel something yes. good, then you feel the pain. Yeah. Maybe you don't notice it. And yes. then the next thing you know, you're pursuing more of the yes. thing. Yes. And I love the way you use the word braided together. That's beautiful. And let me also just say uh, something that I find also fascinating in my work with patients. And I see this all the time. There are people for whom bad life experiences, loss, you know, in any form, stress in many different forms, that's a trigger. But there are absolutely people for whom 
The trigger is things going well. And the things going well can be like the reward of the things going well, but very often what it is is the removal of the hypervigilant state that's required to keep their use in check. So it's this sense of, I want to celebrate, you know, or I want to, this reward happened, I want to put more reward on there. And it's really, really fascinating because when people come to that realization about themselves, that they're most vulnerable when things are going well, um, that's really a valuable insight because then they can put some, you know, things in place or barriers in place or go to more meetings or whatever it is that they do, you know, to protect themselves. What is pornography doing to the brain? Well, first of all, it's triggering the release of dopamine and in the short term testosterone by the observation of sex, not actually engaging in human contact. Think about the young brain being significantly more plastic and willing to rewire than the adult brain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there's no question about it. It's hyperplastic. Yeah. And of course it can wire rewire again, but you think about somebody who engages in a lot of porn watching, right? Watching porn, and that person is getting dopamine and testosterone increases by observing sex and not actually by engaging in human contact, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's concerning, right? And there, and obviously the, um, people vary, but it should come as no surprise that a lot of these people have trouble with um, romantic interactions when they do happen, right? Because they their brain isn't conditioned to respond to those, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And there's variation there, I'm sure. And, and these are private matters, so there aren't good data because there aren't laboratory experiments that you could do on this sort of thing that uh, someone will probably <laughs> do those experiments eventually. But, but also dopamine seeking is what triggers the increase in testosterone. But as we just talked about it with repeated dopamine seeking or triggering of dopamine release, it starts getting diminished, diminished, diminished. So pretty yeah. soon that behavior is not causing the release of testosterone. Now people are just doing it compulsively to try and get some little droplet of dopamine out of their out of their brain. Mm -hmm. I personally think that porn and the availability of porn is is a real is a real detriment to the developing brain, especially to the developing brain. Yeah. Now it sounds like you rescued the behavior. Um, yeah. and it takes some discipline, right? I imagine. And it it's one of those things that um, it's also anxiety -less compared to dating and relationships where people are vulnerable on both sides and have to negotiate things like you know, consent and timing and, you know, and communication and all the things that are really hard to do, but are essential to do. That's, that's key. So I think, uh, pornography is a serious issue and because of the way that it taps into these very primitive systems, it's as serious in, in my mind as some of the other drugs of abuse, like the, the opioid crisis and we talked about cell phones. You ever notice that when you get on a phone, and you're scrolling Instagram, it's like a lot of fun. Like this stuff is cool. You're seeing people. And then sometimes you're on there and like, this doesn't feel good, but I'm doing it anyway. Yeah, I'm just doing it. That's exactly how people talk about their drug use. That's exactly how people talk about alcohol use. That's exactly how people talk about gambling. You imagine this high, but the high doesn't show up and that's, you, you're dopamine depleted. You need to take some time away from it and then come back and then you can enjoy it again. Now with pornography, it's a slippery slope. Right. There's also a whole aspect of pornography, which is that if people are pursuing pornography and they're not pursuing relationships, there is the potential that they reach their twenties and thirties and they are truly dysfunctional in terms of, look, every species has two major goals, protect the young and make more of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not you decide to have children or not is a, is a personal issue. I personally don't have children. I may someday, but every species protects its young, the, the, Maternal aggression is amazing, right? A mother protecting its young, there's nothing like it in the animal kingdom. Actually, that's not triggered by testosterone, that's triggered by estrogen, mm -hmm. which is interesting. But the parents of every species try and protect the young and they try and make more young. This is, this is like every species is, is driven to do that. Mm -hmm. And you think about what porn and masturbation, these things are, really are. I'm not calling them sinful. What I'm saying is they are potentially addictive especially with the availability of pornography. So, um, you know, beware, you know, just everyone's different and, and people have to have to be careful about these circuitries. You really need to protect them. They are, they're super valuable. And so I would say in keeping with our theme of, you know, what are the other things to do to support testosterone would be, uh, don't engage, I would avoid pornography, frankly, 
I really would. I would, you know, maybe everyone's got their threshold for what's too much. For some people that might be, the number might be zero. For some other people, it might be something different. Then it's going to vary. Yeah. It would be different maybe using your imagination versus uh, seeing images or like, you know, is there a difference, which, if you know any of this, is there a difference between video versus, you know, old school way of like having <laughs> magazines and things like that? Well, it's because like, it, it, it's like more fantasy and maybe... I don't know, maybe you thinking it through about this thing is different than you just watching. Or even uh, yeah. remembering past experiences. Yeah, so we can speculate there a bit. Um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words and a movie is worth a billion pictures. Um, when oh. it comes to the, the impact that it has on your nervous system. That's a bar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, exactly. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm, I think it's fair to say that whatever problems exist in society today almost certainly existed a hundred years ago, but in a different form. Mm -hmm. Okay. We always think, oh, you know, stress was only there for the saber tooth tiger. And now there are no tigers. And we got this thing that's really unfortunate called stress. Look, let's imagine this was a hundred years ago. Spouses still cheated. People still died. You had, you know, physical challenges. There was a question of how, you know, all that stuff is, is baked into us at a deep level, mm -hmm. right? None of those circuits have changed. It's just the circumstances that trigger them change. So I think that a hundred years ago, it wasn't cell phones. It might, but you can bet that there was, there were forms of pornography. They, they were probably more uh, cloistered away. They weren't, you know, as out there um, in certain parts of the world, it's still very, very uh, cloistered away despite the internet. So I think that what's healthy in this domain has never really been defined. This is one of the challenges. We know what an eating disorder is, but what's eat healthy eating, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you draw the line? I think given this uh, general theme that relationships are healthy, friendships are healthy, romantic relationships are healthy, and anything that inhibits the pursuit and functioning of, of healthy relationships is where you have to start saying, wait a second, I, is this behavior getting in the way? So look, it's, it's unlikely to be an all or none, um, I think, uh, and I don't know what the line is, but we just have to be careful anytime we are overwhelmed with powerful images of increasing intensity that's where you start getting into the dopamine depletion mm. that's where you start getting into the hormone depletion that that we're that we're talking about here so this is also true of violence mm. a lot of people they're like excited about watching zombie apocalypse violence plus all of that violent sex and everything getting poured into the same film well they made horror movies you know 50 years ago they were a little bit different the question is how strong were we driving the system and if anyone out there is feeling underwhelmed and kind of like life is no good, et cetera, chances are your dopamine system has been pushed too hard. I'll give one quick anecdote of a friend. He's got a kid, he's 21, he graduated high school. He went to community college for a little bit, decide not to do that anymore. Then he stopped working, he stopped exercising. He's really fit. He's got like, his genetics are like Nasimas. He's kind of like, he's just got this incredible physique and all that. Doesn't do anything. Doesn't work, doesn't do anything. He's a failure to launch as we call it. And they were analyzing, does he have ADHD? Does he this? And he heard Anna talk about dopamine depletion. And he called me and he said, and he said I'm going to do one month, no video games, no phone, no nothing. He's 25 days in and he's running again. He's lifting again. He's heading back to work again. And That's this awesome. was somebody who thought he had ADHD. Now there are people with ADHD out there, but what happened was he was dopamine depleted. So he mm. couldn't concentrate. He didn't care about anything. And so... Mm. The phone and just living in this constant stream of movies that are really stimulating on YouTube and everything else. I mean, you have to be, I mean, we're on YouTube right now and I use YouTube for my podcast and everything, but you have to know when to shut that valve. And here's what I tell myself, shut that valve so that I can continue to enjoy it, right? It's like gorging yourself with tomahawk steaks. They're delicious, but unless you've been fasting all day, you're not going to eat nine of them, right? What's your record, Mark? I think I've done two. Two. But yeah, nine would be, yeah. a, that would be a feat. Yeah. yeah. Two, but they were the size of, you know, the table, mm -hmm. but no. Um, so you have, if you want to continue to enjoy things and pursue things, you have to know when to slam the gate shut. And I think that no one told us that we needed to do that. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. So if I interpret uh, that in the context of this discussion about um, libido, sex, porn, and masturbation, if somebody has a very intense sexual experience, and not not here we're not necessarily talking about an intense um, orgasm, we're talking about just an in, you know a lot of intense visual, so very um, a lot of intense imagery or auditory input or both. 
that is going to lead to a situation where dopamine is going to be depleted afterwards. Correct. A, a guest on this podcast uh, before, my colleague at Stanford, Dr. Anna Lemke, who's an expert in addiction, talked a bit about this, the sort of seesawing. I, you were talking about a wave and a crashing out of the water from the wave pool there. It was a seesawing from pleasure and pain. There's going to be a longer and deeper period of lack of pleasure following that. And I think a lot of people think, oh, well, that's great. You know, they want the intense experience. But if that intense experience is coming from pornography and masturbation, or I suppose coming from, you know, high adrenaline activities like, you know, life, uh, life risking parkour hanging off the side of a building, it inevitably is going to lead to depressive episodes, low libido episodes that follow. Is that right? Correct. In a similar physiologic way, uh, to withdrawal from stimulants like amphetamines. Now, is sex with a partner different? Because there are many people who are chasing more and more intense experiences with a partner as opposed to through pornography and masturbation. Again, here we're talking about all ages, and I should always say, anytime we're talking about sex with a partner, we're talking, I, you know, the, the four conditions that I always um, lay out on the uh, Human Room Lab podcast are that we're talking about consensual, age appropriate, context appropriate, species appropriate interactions. And uh, this is also a case where the dose makes the poison. So if there's, you know, obviously meeting all those criteria, if they have one preference um, that for both of them is a positive experience, then that is likely okay. You're not gonna be able to maintain dopamine over a certain threshold for a long period of time. So there very well may be a crash from the experience as well. And the crash may be different in one partner than the other. Oh, I'll draw an analogy to food. It'd be like, you know, you don't have to serve the banquet meal seven, seven nights of the week, maybe just two. Is that right? And there are other delicious foods out there. Can, I, yes. can we use that analogy? That is very okay. reasonable. Okay, not trying to be PG-13, just trying to uh, uh, um, parsimony, Occam's razor, the ability to describe a lot of things in, in, a, in a few words. I'd like to return to the key things that people should do, or I should say the key things that men should do to optimize their hormones. So we talked about getting some movement, getting some sunlight, getting quality social connection one way or the other, avoid excessively frequent masturbation and viewing pornography. And for some people, zero might be the optimal number. And I keep for coming most, back to for this most people. for most people. Interesting. Uh, I feel so fortunate to have grown up prior to the availability of internet pornography. I've never been a big consumer of pornography. I've just not been my thing. But I hear so often from males of all ages about their addiction to it, their affliction by it. It's really a serious issue. And that's one of the reasons why I'm grateful that you're willing to talk about this and your clinical experience with these patients. Are you ready to conquer NoFap? Grab our digital NoFap guide now. End your porn addiction, skyrocket your self-esteem, and achieve your goals. Packed with proven techniques, expert advice, and relapse prevention tricks. Click the link below and break free today. You mentioned porn and masturbation. Um, this topic has come up a bunch of times on this podcast and on other podcasts I've gone on because of the relationship between dopamine, uh, sexual motivation and sexual behavior. And I've been of the pretty strong stance that while I'm not judging porn or masturbation, it can create a brain wiring situation where males in particular essentially teach their brain to be aroused by watching other people have sex as opposed to being the first person actor in mm -hmm. sexual uh, interactions. In that sense, um, you know, that's more about the brain wiring and neuroplasticity and dopamine. But what are your thoughts on porn and masturbation as they relate to hormones? I mean, this is a big debate on the internet. In fact, one of the most uh, common debates is whether or not masturbation increases or decreases testosterone in males. Certainly, it will decrease motivation to go find sexual partners. We know this. Yes. Um, and there are more and more data on this all the time. In terms of the effects of pornography and masturbation, and here I suppose we need to be um, somewhat specific and operationally define what we're talking about. We're talking about porn and masturbation to the point of ejaculation, mm -hmm. right? My understanding is that the ejaculation and, and orgasm associated with it causes an increase in prolactin, which blunts libido for some period of time. The duration of that will vary from person to person and circumstance to circumstance. But basically all of this points to the fact that porn and masturbation can really limit libido in the real world. 
and to me, uh, pornography and the screen is not the real world. Though screens exist in the real world, the real world doesn't exist in the screen. That's an accurate statement. And prolactin does have a significant acute increase after uh, ejaculation. It does to some degree after orgasm as well, but prolactin acts on the pituitary to inhibit the release of the hormones LH and FSH, of which LH can increase testosterone. So this may be one of the cases where the dose makes the poison. And if it is a very frequent habit, certainly uh, daily or more than once a day would be very detrimental from a hormonal component, not even taking into account the, the neural wiring. Listen, I think it's terrific that you've actually defined frequency because this is the problem on the internet or even in the doctor's office, you'll see um, descriptions about pornography being dangerous for certain things or, or detrimental to hormones. People say frequent, but what's frequent? So you're yeah. saying daily or multiple times per day would be potentially detrimental to the hormone profile of a male of essentially any age. And that's just for masturbation. Uh, with porn use as well, it would likely be worse. Why, why is that? Just this, this, the sort of dopaminergic drive of the stimulus, just the really intense visual stimulus? Dopamine sensitivity. Um, I think that uh, using the analogy of a dopamine wave pool, it would deepen the pool, but not increase your supply of dopamine. Um, in terms of the other things that all males should do, meaning all males of all ages, um, puberty and beyond, uh, should do, what, what are some of those things? So on a daily basis, uh, maybe you could just take us through the arc of a day and um, and push out some of the protocols that you use or the things that you like to see your male patients use in order to try and optimize their hormone status. I'll briefly touch on some of the lifestyle pillars to start. Diet and exercise are the first two. Um, in puberty, sleep is particularly important, of course. Um, but with diet and exercise, uh, throughout a lifespan, you want to not exclude things that are helping you. For example, during puberty, if you're consuming dairy and then all of a sudden you cut out all dairy, dairy can help increase IGF-1 and free IGF-1. And, and just uh, again is, for our audience, maybe you just mentioned what, IG, what having enough IGF-1 can do for us that's beneficial is? It helps you grow. It uh, helps with uh, genital development, secondary sexual characteristics, and long bone growth. Um, skin growth, hair growth, a host of things. So getting an array of nutrients that include dairy, what other sorts of nutrients are important during development? You wanna have adequate vitamin D. Vitamin D helps with testosterone production. It helps again with bone mineralization and stature. Um, after an age of about 25, and there's not a strict cutoff, but up to about an age of 25, optimizing your growth hormone and IGF-1 helps with bone density and bone growth. Uh, from the dietary standpoint, you wanna have enough free estrogen, not too much when you're growing, but you want to help basically stockpile bone to prevent a risk of osteoporosis or thin bones fractures when you're older. Well, someone who broke his left foot five times while in high school, uh, I can say you know, whatever young people can do to optimize their uh, bone density would be great. That problem seems to have resolved itself over time, but I don't know, back then I was, um, I did a short run as a vegetarian, but I've always been an omnivore. I realize that some of this relates to ethics and food allergies and things of that sort, but would you say that on balance that most people would benefit from eating a combination of, you know, quality proteins from animal sources and non-animal sources, fruits, vegetables, and starches? I mean, what do you think, for instance, about people following a pure carnivore or a very uh, pure vegan diet in their 20s and 30s? In their late 20s, it might be a reasonable option. In early 20s and certainly teens, it is a horrible idea because it is likely to significantly decrease your free androgens. So you will have less testosterone acting on receptors through the body. Are there any other micronutrients or macronutrients that people in their 20s and 30s should emphasize? We haven't really touched on fatty acids or fiber too much. Uh, fiber is going to be paramount in kind of like setting your set point of your gut microbiome the rest of your life. There is prebiotic fiber, which you could think of as fish food for your good gut microbiome. Your gut microbiome is kind of like an aquarium or a fish tank. Now I'm just thinking about goldfish swimming around and that the goldfish eating people don't eat goldfish people. Um, but any fiber or food that you're putting in your gut, it's either going to, it's going to skew your gut microbiome towards something that is more beneficial or, or more detrimental. 
And would you say that the prebiotic fiber and the getting essential fatty acids, uh, that would be important to do throughout the lifespan or just for the people in their 20s and 30s? Throughout the lifespan, um, particularly important in the teenage 20s, 30s, because it helps with brain development. Um, you're certainly more of an expert than me when it comes to um, brain development, but it does continue to de develop th really throughout the lifespan, but certainly through the 20s and 30s as well. What about um, taking a multivitamin while you're growing up? So many people um, do that. Uh, is it necessary? Is it useful? And if it's not necessary, is it safe to do anyway? It's generally safe to do anyway. Um, I do not think everybody needs a multivitamin. The more exclusionary your diet is, for example, if you have uh, celiac disease or if you're planning on fertility soon, then perhaps it's more reasonable to take a multivitamin. In a previous discussion of ours, I asked you about um, caloric restriction and testosterone. And if I recall correctly, the idea was that if somebody is overweight, they have excess fat adipose tissue, then getting rid of some of that adipose tissue by, through caloric restriction and exercise, provided it's done not too fast in a healthy way, is going to be beneficial for testosterone in the long run. But that for individuals who are not carrying an excess of body fat, caloric restriction is actually going to lower testosterone. That's correct. Um, if you look at an individual in a caloric deficit, several changes will happen. One is that they'll have less building blocks for hormones. Another is that they will be in a catabolic state more often, so that balance of anabolism and cat catabolism will be different. They'll likely have less signaling from growth hormone and IGF-1, and they'll also have the high SHBG that we defined earlier as the binding protein, so their free androgens and free estrogens will go down.